Good afternoon, and I'm the uh, past president of the International Academy of Oral Medicine Toxicology, and that uh, I uh, conducted a risk assessment on behalf of the Academy back in 1998, and that uh, one of the things that we get into is dose, and one of the things that uh, the fluoridation people never want to talk about is dose. Why is that? Because in uh, toxicology, they say dosus solum one facet. Dose alone makes the poison. And so here's the recommended dose for a baby. None. So water fluoridation delivers to an infant a dose of fluoride that would be gross malpractice if any physician, family physician, dentist, or licensed practitioner in the state of California were to write a prescription for that amount. Therefore, you have a duty to inform the parents about this increased dose beyond what the family doctor can prescribe and warn them to not make up tap water formula. I thought water was supposed to be safe for all of us. Even the ADA agrees. They warn their members, not you, not the water districts. Of course they recommend fluoridation. But they tell members to tell their parents of children to make up tap water formula with fluoride-free water. Make up the formula with fluoride-free water so the baby won't get fluorosis. Interesting they use the term fluorosis. It's not dental fluorosis. Fluorosis is the body, joints, ligaments, tendons, brain, the endocrine system. When you overdose infants with fluoride, you cause adverse responses systemically. And even the advocates for fluoridation agree that if it works, it works topically, not systemically. But systemically is dental fluorosis. And when you can see spots on children's teeth, you've got to be a dentist to believe you've poisoned that child enough to cause spots on their teeth, and that's the only organ that was impacted. The level of dental fluorosis in the community is proportional to the level of fluoride in the water supply. That's because people drink the water. And the exposure to fluoride is what causes dental fluorosis. So your decision to add fluoride to the water supply will increase the number of children with dental fluorosis. In California, dental fluorosis is a proven adverse effect, and it costs a lot to fix. Dr. Nelson's talking about a billion dollars for dental care. There's more than that spent on fixing funny-looking spotted teeth. Don't take my word. Open up the yellow pages. Bleaching and other methods to fix teeth that are discolored by fluoride in the water supply. And you've been very generous. Is You've indemnified the California Dental Association and Dr. Nelson and everybody else that told you to put it in the water supply for any adverse effects. Thank you very much. But the only way to get around that is for you to warn the recipients of your water that it's no longer safe for the population to drink. Next you'll hear from Dr. Kathleen Thiessen. She's an expert on risk assessment and she works uh, as one of the directors uh, for the uh, Senes Oak Ridge Center for Risk Analysis in Tennessee. She served for three years on the National Academies of Science Review of Fluoride in the Drinking Water is an expert in endocrine function, how your glands work, how your hormones work, and whether or not fluoride affects those. Listen to Dr. Thiessen explain to you the dose of fluoride and how that relates to levels that are known to cause harm from water fluoridation. Thank you for this opportunity to address the committee. I understand from Mr. Dimelli's presentation that your plans to fluoridate are in place. I wish simply to inform you of some of the implications of those plans. The first graph illustrates the expected range of consumption of public tap water for various age groups. This is information from the Environmental Protection Agency in quantities of milliliters per day. These ranges include only people who actually consume tap water. And you need to note the red diamonds indicate that some people consume substantially more water than the usual range. The total consumption of community water shown here is not to be confused with total fluid consumption or total water consumption. It does not include well water, bottled water, or commercial beverages. The second graph shows the same ranges per unit of body weight, so milliliters per kilogram of body weight. Note that infants have the highest tap water consumption per unit body weight, with some infants reaching more than 250 milliliters per kilogram per day. That's a a half a cup per pound of, of baby. In general, the people with the highest tap water intakes include babies fed formula made with tap water, 
people with certain medical conditions, people in unair conditioned residences, people who work outside in hot climates or do heavy physical labor, and athletes. This graph shows the estimated fluoride intakes for each age group. This is based on the water ranges shown in the last slide, assuming 0.8 parts per million fluoride, which I understand is the plan for this area. And also shown that red vertical line is EPA's reference dose at 0 0.06 milligrams per kilogram per day. This is defined as an estimate of a daily oral exposure to the human population. For fluoride, as I said, the reference dose is 0 0.06 milligrams per kilogram per day. As seen in the graph, many infants have a fluoride intake just from tap water well above that reference dose. Children with Older children with high water consumption will also exceed that and even adults and teenagers, the highest water consumptions come very close to that. Note that this graph shows estimated fluoride intakes only from tap water. It does not include other sources such as commercial beverages made with fluoridated tap water or toothpaste, tea, or food. When these other sources of fluoride intake are included, total fluoride intakes for many members of all age groups will exceed EPA's reference dose. The final graph shows the estimated fluoride intakes from tap water from that last slide, plus estimates of no effect levels for a number of adverse health effects, many of which were described in the National Research Council report, which was put out last year. I was one of the authors of this. These no effect levels represent fluoride intakes at or below which most people are not expected to experience any harmful effects. Note that these estimates are based on population averages. They do not include a margin of safety. They might not be protected for everybody, and intakes above these levels cannot be considered safe. You need to notice that most of these no effect levels are below EPA's reference dose, indicating that EPA's reference dose is not protective of many of these health effects. Note also that most of these no effect levels are exceeded or will be exceeded by many members of the population with fluoride at 0.8 parts per million in community drinking water. When other fluoride sources are included, even more people will exceed the no effect levels. In order to be safe for all members of the population, fluoride intakes for all people must be kept below the lowest no effect level when all sources of fluoride intake are included and with an adequate margin of safety. This list of adverse health effects does not include cancer. A carcinogenic or cancer-causing effect of fluoride cannot be ruled out from the available data, and at the very least, a cancer-promoting effect is likely. For carcinogenic substances, the risk of cancer increases with the amount of exposure such that even a very low exposure carries with it some cancer risk. In conclusion, I'd like to quote from a director of laboratories from the City of New York Department of Water Supply, Gas, and Electric from a presentation in 1956 that's still relevant today. It is obvious from the knowledge of fluoride toxicity that an appropriate factor of safety cannot be established when fluoride is added to the public water supply at the level recommended by the proponents of fluoridation, and must be concluded that the fluoridation of public water supplies is a hazardous procedure. People are bound to get hurt. It remains to find out how many and when. So I'll be happy to answer questions later. Thank you for the opportunity. Do the board members have any uh, questions of Dr. Tyson? Uh, seeing none, thank you, doctor. No questions? No question to ask their expert, Dr. Kathleen Thiessen? They invited her to speak and explain to them what the National Academy of Sciences determined. She explained that they're going to be poisoning 64,000 babies. And they couldn't think of a single question to ask? How do these people get their job?